What is up, everybody? Jim to my right, Mr. Ryan Muckenhern, across from us right now in studio. Ryan, you've been out for the last couple days. Yeah. It's nice to have you back. Thanks. Where, where were you real quick? Uh, we were in Godna, Massachusetts. You ever been there before? That was the first time on the uh, northeast of this great country. I was, was, it, uh, I was very near the origins of our, our nation. Yes. It was great. I, I met a lot of very patriotic Dump people. Dump a little tea in the harbor? Uh, didn't. Drove, drove <laughs> Maybe, by. Is that a fence? Maybe that was, that was, was a not bad. offensive. I don't know. That's I like don't one want of the to... most American things you've ever said on this Before show. we derail this any further, I do have to talk about a particular signage that I saw quite often. Um, if we were driving around a like a suburban neighborhood mm-hmm. here in the Midwest, um, you would see a sign that says like children at play or... Or slow children. Or densely, yeah. densely populated. There's a sign that indicates there's a lot of people here. Mm-hmm. Right, so that you go slow, that you're cognizant of pot- potential pedestrians. Yeah, there they use a c- classic yellow diamond that mm-hmm. says "thickly settled." Wow, settled, thickly settled. Only in the east would they yeah. use the term "settled" still thickly to describe settled. people. Um, it was residing so there. calling me thick. It was so um, noteworthy that I had to take a picture of thickly settled. It That's interesting. Just, it kind of seems like a long way to get to the point. I it, mean, I know it's two words. It just it seems, seems like hey, very hey, British. It's, it's not really 1770s anymore. Yeah. It's, it's thickly settled. Interesting. Saw them everywhere in those places that match that criteria. Speaking of thick, the barrel on this Ruger Precision My, Rifle. So Goodness. hold on. Let me get. The, start over. Go ahead, Mark. No, we're not starting over. <laughs> <laughs> we're talking about today. Because I got a thing here. I got a story, Jim. I know Another you do. Story. I know. Okay. The Ruger Precision Rifle. The Ruger RPR. And we were talking a little bit before this podcast about a time, Ryan, when this rifle came out. Mm. I There was one showing up daily at Vortex. Yeah. For a period, yeah. Uh, you were saying that... Uh, Mr. Ken got like the first one, and then there was a little bit of a it was a delay, a delay. Yeah. But then when they when they came, I mean they they flooded the Vortex market every day. Somebody was getting a new RPR. It's Fact. Like boom, 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 and for good reason. Absolutely. What uh, What are the reasons? I would like to share a story. Please. I think this rifle and the companion cartridges it was chambered in changed the way that Americans shoot. Yes. Really? I'm glad you said that. That is a bold If you didn't say that, I would have said it. Unquestionably, I think that this gun changed the American shooting marketplace. Yeah. How so? This was the this was the Viper PST of rifles. In fact, it was. It the okay, so the feature set of the RPR. I'm not going to say the Ruger RPR because it's pretty redundant. That's like saying Ruger Ruger RPR. Or excuse me, Ruger Ruger precision rifle. Just right. the RPR. Yeah, it's the RPR. Yeah, just the RPR. Um the feature set that the rifle comes out of the box, ready to go with, is catered toward the precision rifle. It's in the name, right? The precision rifleman. Uh, so th- this is like a generation two now. So there's a, a few iterations of this gun, but the first go of them um, w- look very much the same, right? So it's a it's a chassis type rifle. Mm-hmm. The first generation had a Picatinny rail that ran the whole length of the, the forend. Mm-hmm. A little bit different forend geometry. Um, came with a different stock on it. Had a little bit more... We did. The guys down at Edge actually added yeah. this. So this is the, one of the Magpul. Uh, I can't remember which PRS. Stocks, PRS stocks. Yeah. But so yeah, it comes with a slightly different one. The original was still a, like a multi-axis adjustable stock, though. So you could you could increase length of pull, change your cheek piece. You, I think you could even induce a little bit of um, canter camber into the, hmm. the butt stock, if I recall. Uh, it's been a minute since I've seen one of those. But... Ergonomic and ambi controls, or are these ambi? Yeah, ergonomic mm-hmm. and ambi controls. The slick part was the magazine, which I thought was really neat. So it took AICS pattern mags, mm-hmm. it took the Magpul AICS pattern mags, and it took SR25 mags, which was super neat. That's convenient. Yes, it is. So if you had an AR10 that was on that pattern, pop that magazine in there. They were chambered in cartridges like 308, 243 Winchester, and 6.5 Creedmoor. And of course, at that time, 6.5 Creedmoor hadn't even been out. A decade, no, and it catapulted it into popularity. I mean, Ruger as a whole got on board with the six five cream war thing right away yes. because I mm-hmm. bought a Ruger American when Ruger Americans were still pretty new, 
and I bought it in 6.5 Creedmoor, so it was still, it was like, okay, I haven't heard of Ruger American really before, and I haven't heard of 6.5 Creedmoor before, but somebody was like, get this, and I was like, fine. Yep. Still I think, have that I think gun. Savage got into it, because I remember when I got my, uh, now we're no, sidetracking again, when I got my Browning A-Bolt, uh, Ryan, the other like kind of like hunting rifle that was a production rifle was the Savage uh, Weather Warrior, I believe. The first one I saw was a TC Icon Weather Shield. It makes sense. The 6.5 Creedmoor came from a now lead balloon cartridge, the 30 TC. Yeah. Yeah. It does make sense. Yeah. But anyway, so this rifle was configured with the competitive or precision marksman or woman in mind. Uh, 20 MOA was a standard rail on there. So you, you already had the built-in cant. Mm -hmm. It came with a heavy profile barrel, a muzzle device on there. Brilliant trigger for what it is. Uh, this is the same trigger system that we see shared in the uh, you know, Ruger American. And similar to a, a couple of these other triggers that have that blade inside of the trigger shoe itself. It's kind of a safety thing. Uh, pretty lightweight uh, trigger pull anyway. Brilliantly accurate. These things shoot phenomenally well. Always have from their introduction forward. It was a rifle that really surprised me uh, that, that came from Ruger. This it was, was a rifle you didn't have to do anything anything no. to just well, put an optic on yep, it correct well and at a price they were like a thousand bucks when they were introduced mm -hmm. and so They've gone up at that point inflation yeah, a little bit but they're still Thanks i mean government. for what they are when you look at when you look at the sum of parts here what a shooter is getting in a precision rifle is a surprising value mm -hmm. so to, to start with say a builder action you know you go buy whatever bolt action flavor that you prefer you buy a nice chassis for it you adorn the chassis with a grip of your choice and a stock of your choice you pick a barrel out you pick a muzzle device out you had a 20 moa rail on there you get, it can get pretty expensive pretty quick it does a, a builder a builder gun can can kind of uh, hurt a little even bit. when you're keeping it fairly bare bones yeah and then you still don't have some of the flexibility that you do with the RPR, like the magazine thing. And I realize it's kind of a small talking point, but I think it's significant, right? So proprietary magazines are the devil, and the ability to use a couple of different types of magazines are quite nice. Mm -hmm. um, and, and again, for me, it was a very surprising gun to come from Ruger. And, and if at that time, or a few years prior, you're going to say, Ruger was going to release a budget-minded precision rifle that was going to change the American shooting landscape, and then I argue the global shooting landscape, mm -hmm. I'm, like, ah, I'm not going to put a five spot on that. Their bread and butter was a traditional hunting rifle, yeah. the Model 77. It's a gun that had been out for a very long time and only a handful of iteration and change. Mauser style action, wood stock. I mean, they made synthetic stocks, of course, but it was a, an iconic hunting rifle. And it was it bore no semblance to this. And then this is what they dropped, and I was shook. And after they did it, Savage had one. Tika had one. Uh, well, who, Remington. who else? Remington yeah. had one. I mean, um, how I had one. I mean, mm -hmm. everybody had one after that. You could find their, whatever it was that was their competition to the Ruger American at the time, yeah. they basically stuck it in a chassis. They did the, it was the RPR uh, formula. Yep. Mm -hmm. And uh, because it it worked, yes, it does. We still use them to this day. What what do you think? What do you think led up to this? Because I feel like I don't know if it was everyone's plan all along to end up with a gun like this. In the, I'm talking about in the gun industry, mm. or if it was almost a bit of a uh, of a pleasant surprise when they themselves realized that the guns that they were making that were actually fairly budget-oriented, that were hunting, you know, targeted mm -hmm. rifles, like the Ruger American, were shockingly accurate. That was the one thing, because I remember, like, it's hard to talk about this without talking about the Ruger American first, right. uh, which we, we, you know that we love on this uh, podcast, and, and many other guns, of course. But that one, um, they came out with it, and you looked at it, and you're like, at the time... 350 bucks or something you kind of expect it to just like okay it'll get the job done sure but then you take it to the range and you're like i'm shooting sub m away with this thing the best group i've ever fired in my life god's honor scouts honor ruger american predator 65 creedmoor no yes yeah. really on uh, like a fool and i'm not saying that as a uh that i don't believe the gun you've just shot a lot of guns yeah, it, yeah. so 
I have two witnesses. They were there. One of them was Travis Brand. Um, I shot it with a golden eagle on top of it. <laughs> yeah, there That's you go. Awesome. Off of off of a Harris bipod that was too tall and a shoddy rear support. We make that we make that recommendation that combination a lot yeah. for uh, deer hunting. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, and um, those guns, it's like it doesn't have a, it doesn't have a Tika level action. No, it doesn't have the greatest trigger in the world. No, it's not impressive to look at. But it's, dang, does it shoot? Oh yeah. And, I, and so I don't know what came first. Did Ruger come out with that knowing eventually they'd have something like this? Or did they come out with that and they were like, guys, we got something here. If we stuck that just in a chassis, gave it a slightly longer, beefier barrel, done. Yeah, I, I think I think so. I think probably at that time, if you wanted a rifle like this, you were investing a fair amount of time and money into configuring it. And you ended up with effectively the same result at a much higher cost to mm-hmm. you as a user. And I think that they were looking at it. It's like, what are people doing anyways? So at the time, the Remington 700 was like the, the heart of all actions or derivatives thereof, clones of 700s. And it's not that. It's not a, it's not a model 700. It, 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 the only semblance it bears to a 700 is that it has a turn bolt, right? If you unpack the action, you really look at how it's laid out, it's wildly different. But chassis were really coming into vogue at that point in time, and they had been prior uh to a degree, I, I don't think anywhere near what they are now. Um, I mean, it's not uncommon to see a chassis rifle ta- attached to somebody's Western hunting backpack. Yep. Right. You know, in fact, it's it's kind of a very often talked about thing. Oh, I'm going to run this chassis rifle. Or trying to make your stock as close to a chassis as possible in function. Correct. And I think that they were over there looking at what the market was doing. And, and by the market, I mean the aftermarket. So people were buying these guns. They were reconfiguring them to end up as this. Why not shorten the gap? cut out all the headache that a a consumer might have to go through to reconfigure his or her rifle into this and just do it like that. I mean, Mm -hmm. it was obviously hot right now. And I think for them, if I'm going to guess, I probably looked at it as a bit of a risk because as a company, again, they never did rifles like this, Mm -hmm. like nothing even close to that. Definitely a departure. But do you think like also like, I mean, the timing, was the timing perfect? Couldn't have been better. Like yeah. you said, you've, you've got a, a movement of people like they're already doing these things. And the componentry at the time, too. Like, you've, at least I look at this thing and I'm seeing like design cues from ARs. Like, hey, you know, yep. you got the, 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 the forend or the handguard there. Like, the safety, uh, the way that that looks, the way the trigger guard looks. I mean, the fact, the grips that you're using, the stocks you can stick on it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Right. You've got all these things that are kind of currently out there. You've got these people that are doing these things. And like you said, shorten the gap, do it in a production rifle so you're not, you know, piecemealing it together, mm-hmm. bringing costs down. Mm-hmm. Um, and then obviously the, uh, man, I look at that time period. We're thinking what this about 2015, kind of 2015, mm-hmm. 16, 17. Yep. You think of the rise in interest of long range performance. I mean, we always talk about it, range finders, ballistic calculators, like all these things were very accessible, like right about at that moment, yes. at least in my mind. Yes, mm-hmm. absolutely, unquestionably. So PRS had been a thing, but maybe in a little bit of different rifle format, but it was definitely gaining in popularity, like hugely. We started talking about PRS a lot. Mm-hmm. First focal plane, index match turrets, uh, a transition from MOA as a gold standard to MRAD as a gold standard. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, clever and neat bipods and all the other accoutrements that come along with that kind of shooting style really started kicking up. And yeah. and I think they they nailed it. This, and, oh, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to interrupt. I was going to say, and on top of that, too, not to like pat our own backs, but just the optics industry as a whole, like we did come out with that Viper PST back in, you know, 2000, what, 11, 10-ish, 11-ish, 12, yeah. 12-ish, somewhere in there. And so, like, that was one of the first scopes that you get. Again, the, the it marries up perfectly with a gun like this where it was like you get a relatively affordable scope with all the precision long-range features right out of the box. Mm-hmm. And then a lot of other optics companies kind of started doing the same thing. And then they started packaging it in even more. Like we have a Strike Eagle 525 on this, which of course came out later on than this 2015, 2016 period. But like they just started doing this more and more and more. So it was like the optics started getting better and more affordable and really streamlining kind of the feature set that long range shooters needed. The rifles start, it was like this perfect marriage all just converged right around that time period. What I think is brilliant now is Ruger 
offers this at a couple different levels. So like this would be a regular Gen 2 RPR. Again, you guys changed the butt stock out. Yeah. Um, but like the out of the box solution is really cool. They make like a competition bred version that is a little bit even more laser focused towards the PRS competitor. Some creature features, a little bit different barrel length of profile, uh, different grip on it, different trigger on there, a little lighter trigger. And then they make a rimfire version. Yeah. which I think is even cooler yet. And it still has the same form factor. So now you have an opportunity for a, a budget-minded trainer, and that gun is a budget build. Like, it's it's not obscenely expensive. If you want to go out and buy a $4,000 22 rifle right now, there you can. I mean, you can put one together. You can buy a very, very nice piece of equipment, and it is lovely. Or you can get a, get a Ruger, you know, precision rifle rimfire. Mm-hmm. And it's brilliant i mean it's beautiful they even offer it in 22 mag and 17 hmr which i think is kind of cool so they shoot so and it's honey i shrunk the rpr yep it's the exact same gun <laughs> yep. it's just a little smaller and, and so and in everything functions the same yep. on it yep and and intelligently yet and to to speak to knowing that those folks are paying attention so this gun out of the box comes with a 20 moa standard rail which mm-hmm. is which is common on a long range precision esque rifle if, if the goal is a thousand yards of 20 moa is a certain certainly a, an assist to you the rimfire version because we require more adjustment to hit targets at distance with those they put a 30 moa on there mm-hmm. their magnum version which they offer in like 338 lapua for instance they put a 30 moa rail on there too so there's there's a a ton of insight and intelligence in the design of the RPR, and I, I think the rifle deserves a tremendous amount of credit for what it brought the marketplace, especially at the time that it brought it. And it is just, like I said, a delightful gun. As you mentioned, it doesn't have the action that you would expect out of, say, a Tika or a builder gun. But it doesn't matter because it just shoots like crazy. They're bonkers reliable. And everything that you would need for that characteristic or our typical precision rifle design is already there, out of the box. Mm-hmm. Yeah, down at uh, Vortex Edge, the long range guys, we have an entire cage full of these guns. This is one of them that I brought up. And we have them on hand for instances in our long range classes where people have brought their own gun and the gun uh, fails to function for some reason, which does happen. Uh, and so we've always got a backup on hand. We can stick this in their hands. Even guys who have multi-thousand dollar guns, they get into this, they're not upset about it, you yep. know, by all means, especially when their uh, gun, for whatever reason, you know, stopped working. Um, but these things just work. They shoot. You can put a new shooter behind it. You can put an experienced shooter behind it. The new shooters, if they're like, wow, what is this gun? How do I get it? You, it's so easy to tell them, go here, add to cart, put an optic on top of it, and you have exactly what you have here. We didn't do anything fancy to it at all. It doesn't require a gunsmith. Uh, we put the stock on it, the PRS stocks on it, because we're constantly adjusting the settings to the stock for different shooters mm-hmm. with classes and the uh, one that comes on it is a, a slight this is a nod to ma- or a, a pat on the back to magpul just for making this prs stock so easy to adjust the one that comes on the ruger is like just not quite as quick um but you know it's not a knock on the on the stock one at all um but i mean that's the only thing we've changed on it we stuck the strike eagle 5 to 25 on it which is a perfect fit and off to the races yeah it's just it's so it's so good the only thing that i don't like about it is that now it's become so ubiquitous, and I love to have weird stuff, that it's the easy button, and I want to get it, but it's it's no longer like the, if I pull it out of the case, everyone's going to ooh and ah over it, or be like, whoa, look at that, what is that weird thing? You know, which I totally, I just, you know, huge attention you seeker. You crave that. I crave it. Kenny, yeah. Kenny had that uh, kind of allure for a little bit there. He's the only guy I knew that had one. He like did, the, the at day, first. The day they were announced, he had one like three days later. And well, and, and, and it, it, at first, too, when you would pull out a gun like this, yeah. people would be like, who built that? And you'd be like, Ruger at yep. a factory. And they'd be like, no. Yeah. Who are you? You an insider? Yeah. The Ruger RPR. Wait, I did it. I did it again. You did it. The RPR. I think a lot of people stay. It, it gets said like that. It, it happens. It, does. it happens, it does. Ryan. It's uh, nothing to be embarrassed about. Um, yeah, this, uh, this, this rifle just exudes performance, practicality, it's just that perfect blend of of price and performance where yeah, you probably you probably can get something that's a little bit that's better, that's more high speed, but for what a person has in this thing out of the box, like 
I think for a lot of folks, it's difficult to justify doing something different. And the stock folds. Everyone loves a stock that folds. You, um, you want to talk a, a testament to whether or not a, a gun is widely accepted as you audit the aftermarket support. Yes. For like yeah. little lickies and chewies and things like that. <laughs> You can, uh, you, you, yep. can, you can get new barrels, you can get new muzzle devices, handguards, grip stocks, rails, magazine release paddles, the whole shebang. It is the bolt action 1022. From, you from, just took the words out of my mouth. From, yeah. that, uh, from that market. That and I love these bolts. I heard a story once that there's a secret John Moses Browning type out there in the industry that made the fat bolt what it is today so this is what we would call you know fat bolts so its lugs are the same diameter as the body okay it's one piece the handles just kind of stuck in there super super simple to machine and allows you a fair amount of flexibility in what you can get away with and you end up with a abbreviated bolt lift you end up with some fun geometry at, at the bottom of the bolt that allows you to run a variety of different magazines and it's just one piece of stock. stout yeah, yeah. And uh, so I've heard that story. And if you're listening, I'd love to meet you. I heard it was an industrial application where the bolt came from. Hmm. Like it was a an anchor of some kind. And they realized that it was the correct diameter to fit inside of a lot of standard diameter receivers. And you could do some magic things with it. That's all hearsay. But it's pretty well, neat, you, John. Where did you hearsay these things? I hearsay this at SHOT Show one year. Yeah, I was noticing a lot of those bolts start to show up in a lot of different guns. Some very expensive, some very economical. And one thing about all of those guns, expensive or economical, it, well, especially the economical ones, they all shot like a house of fire. Every mm. one of those things from 299 bucks to 799 bucks, that employed that three lug fat bolt design. Every one of those rascals hammered. Mm. And I thought, it's too simple. Where did this come from and why? And how is it that everybody has it now? And that's what I heard. That was a story I was told. What we need to do is a... a, a a podcast on bolts and bolt design mm, because mm -hmm. to, I mean to the casual shooter you look at a bolt and you're kind of like I mean these are all the same right yeah but then when you actually break it all down you're like no these are wildly di I mean this is different than a Tika bolt it's different than oh, yeah. a, than a uh, you know a Weatherby bolt it's different than a Winchester bolt they're all very oh, uniquely got, designed yeah controlled feed push feed I mean there's extractor you know differences and stuff like that it's very it's very interesting stuff mm -hmm. but uh Anyway, the RPR. If nothing else, it's got a stock that folds. And that's neat. It is. I tried to make my Ruger American as cool as an RPR, and I ended up spending a bunch more money than I would have if I had just gotten an RPR. And I, I argue that the RPR is just better than what I created. You wanted, and I should have just kept my American as an American. It you, you wanted the RPR, but you didn't like how easy it was just to exactly get there. That was my problem. Yes. It's a cool gun. I mean, just, yeah. I mean, the the amount of these things down at Vortex Edge, the level at which they're ran, you, uh, the, the, the cadence at which they're ran, and how they just keep running and doing a great job is, uh, oh, it's a testament to the platform. That's that. That's that. I'm going to go ahead and say it, Ryan. The Ruger RPR. There you have it, folks. Do you have one? Uh, I'd say odds are pretty high. A lot of folks have these, and and for good reason. Anything else, gentlemen, before we sign off? What's the farthest someone shot with an RPR? Ruben and I were playing at 14 and a quarter once. Yeah? yeah. Six five. Yeah. Neat. Okay, well. How far have you shot with yours? Yeah, beat that. Oh, I bet with those Lapuas. <sighs> Do boy. Yeah. yeah. Show. All right, let us know, everybody. Do you have an RPR? Do you like it? Or do you love it? You probably love it. Uh, until next time, happy hunting and shooting. We'll catch you on the next one. See you. Bye.